welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue on in our study of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the Ephesians. And this is now our sixth part of this, and we're actually going to get out of the first chapter. Wow. After only six weeks. Hallelujah. It's better to do, you know, you can't spend too much time in the Word. You can't can't overdo it. I'm convinced you can't overdo it. So we're going to start that, and we're going to pick up, we're going to be, we ended last week right at the end of chapter 1, shy two verses. So we're going to pick up there and then go into the second chapter, right after Mark asks for God's blessing on our time together. Oh, Lord, you said... In your word, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask. So, Lord, we ask for wisdom to see what's in your word, to put it in our hearts, minds, and lives. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, as I said, last week, we we ended right at the end of uh, chapter 1. I just want to touch on that. Um, we were talking about Christ being far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one also in the one to come. So we're talking about his authority, right? And his rule. Yes. So now we're going to pick up we're at verse 22, chapter 1, verse 22. And I'm going to read 22 and 23. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. There's the, there's the head and there's a body. And you don't want to have a body without a head. Not at all. Mm-hmm. You've heard, you're familiar with the expression like a chicken with its head cut off? All right. Well, to operate without a head is like being a chicken with its head cut off. Just mm-hmm. whatever they do, which is probably not nice. <laughs> I know that uh, Alice and I lived in Westchester County in New York, in the suburbs of New York City, which is where Sleepy Hollow is. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had Tarrytown, New York. Tarrytown, New York, and we actually got to minister to uh, uh, a couple of people, elders in a Dutch Reformed church up there. And that, of course, is where uh, the tale of Sleepy Hollow came from by Washington Irving, right? And in that, he talks about the headless horseman, right? I'm going to tell you something. There's no fiction in the world. It doesn't have a root in truth. Mm, that's true. Yeah. Okay. You don't want to have a body without a head, but Christ is the head. Yes. So if you're operating without Christ in your life, you are that proverbial chicken running around with your head cut off. Right. Okay. All right. So God the Father gave him as head over all things, it says, right? Mm-hmm. So we were talking about the fact that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? You, talking about God, God has put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. That's from the letter of Hebrews, Hebrews 2.8. So Christ is head over everything, but we don't see that. Why? Because although he is head over all things, the world is in the power of the evil one, and the world is in rebellion. Yes. For now, the world is in utter rebellion. And when I talk about the world, I'm talking about the people of the world, the governments of the world. Mm-hmm. They're all in rebellion to God. Okay? The church of the world? Well, the church is if they're not uh, acting with Christ as the head, right? So that's true for now, but a time is coming, and I don't think it's too far off. Well, I'll tell you what the time is. Let me read it to you from Revelation, the book of Revelation, in chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 11 to 16. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. 
and the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So that time is coming. But that said, that's if he's going to put the, the world in submission, right? Mm-hmm. But let's talk about the church for a minute, right? It certainly should be evident even now in the church that he is Lord, the Lord Jesus, right? And the head. Because when it's not evident in the church and we act like the world, mm-hmm. we're, we are in rebellion. And that leads to sinful living. And Paul said that that leads to, he said, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles and believers through you, as it is written, Romans 2, 24. So if you're acting in rebellion to God, God's name is, you're giving, you're giving the devil an opportunity. And of course, it says in Ephesians here later, do not give the devil an opportunity. Yes. People blaspheme God because of the way the church acts yes. when we are not acting as Christ being head over us. Right? Yes. Right, so let's move right along into the second chapter. Ephesians 2, I'm going to read the first two verses. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And we were walking with no, you were more than that. You were the walking dead. Yeah. Literally the walking dead. I mean, this is hard to understand. Again, I, you know, I said a minute ago, there's no fiction that doesn't have a, a root and truth. Now, that, that show is a program. I've never seen it. I have no desire to see it. But it's a, it's a really popular series, apparently, which has been, it's been nominated for so many awards <clears throat> over the 10 years since 2010 that it's starting. Uh, and that's called The Walking Dead. Mm. You, you, um, you probably sure. heard of it, okay? Absolutely. That plays on the fascination that people have with zombies. What are zombies? Yeah. They're The Walking Dead. Mm. Dead people walking among us. That's because of the underlying truth of that matter that the world, and perhaps much of the church, doesn't seem to understand life and death. They don't understand life and death. I'm going to go right back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, talking about Adam, right, in the garden, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. God's word is holy. God's word is true, and he watches over to perform it. When Adam and the woman sin, it is written, I'm going on to chapter 3, verse 23, verses 23 and 24 in Genesis. Mm-hmm. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the, of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Scripture reveals that Adam spent 930 years on earth. But he died the day that he sinned. Why? He was a zombie. He was the walking day. Why? Because he was separated from the tree of life and separated from the giver of life, the Lord God. And it's, you know, it says in Isaiah 59, verse 2, that your iniquities, your sin, have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from him so that he does not hear. That is death. Death is not about your body stops. Death is about the fact that you're separated from God. And that's when Jesus died on the cross. When he was separated. was separated from God and cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He turned his face from Jesus Christ. So, again, let me just say this. Satan has no creative power whatsoever, okay? He can't bring anything into existence out of nothing. He can only corrupt 
that which already exists. Mm -hmm. So while the adversary is the father of lies, he can't create those lies out of nothing. But a lie has to be a corruption of an existing truth. Makes sense. Oh, and by the way, death has been conquered. Mm -hmm. Where's that victory? Where's this change? <laughs> that's, that's rather important. Yes. Yeah. So we'll see and understand the truth of that when, as Paul wrote, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, we will be changed. Mm -hmm. For this imperishable must put on the this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written: Death is swallowed up in victory. Mm -hmm. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Hallelujah. Do you know that Jesus, when, when Lazarus was sick and Lazarus died, right? And Jesus went to, to the goat and raised him from the dead. His Lazarus' sister, Martha, met Jesus. And she was saying to him, you know, if you'd only been here, if you'd only been here. She said, and he, she said, well, I know he's going to rise in the resurrection. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. And the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He said to her. That's John 11, 25 and 26. The question becomes, do you believe it? Do you believe the word of God? That he said that if you believe in him, you'll never die. So how can you fear death since you can't do it? Well, you did do it, because on the day that you were born again, it says you died and your life was hidden in Christ with God, right? If you hadn't died, there would be no reason to be born again. Right, because it says it's appointed unto man to die once and then the judgment. So if you're listening to me and you have a relationship, a right relationship with Jesus Christ, it's because you died. You died. You were crucified. You were buried with him. Hallelujah. It's done. It's over. It wasn't too bad, was it? <laughs> okay, let me go on to the next verse. Verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Among them, Paul says. Who's them? The sons of disobedience, otherwise known as the world. And when it comes to the world, you can't be unequally yoked. Mm. Now you can't. You don't have to go out of the world, right? You're in it. But You're in it, but not of it. Yeah. You can visit with them mm -hmm. to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, but you can't be bound together with them. He says, "We, we too, all formerly lived." The key here, of course, is formerly lived, mm -hmm. because it's quite evident in the New Testament in our new life in Christ. That it demands a new lifestyle. Yes. Okay? If you have new life, you have to need a new lifestyle. Now, Paul writes a little later here in Ephesians, and he says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the way. It's Ephesians 5 8. Mm -hmm. you, you better be able to say, or sing that song, and that should be your anthem. What a difference he's made in my life because he gave you life, all right? And I, I like this, by the way, the King James translates that formerly lived mm -hmm. as had our conversation. Mm -hmm. Sound different? Mm -hmm. That sounds like a strange difference. But consider this Luke, Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, I'm reading Luke 6 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Can you hear that? Yes. James kind of is writing a commentary on that, in my opinion, when he writes, this is James 3, verses 4 and 6. Look at the ships also. Though they're so great and are driven by strong winds, they're still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. 
So the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life, and it is set on fire by hell. I can't see your heart. I can't know your heart. I, I, I shouldn't say I can't know your heart. Because it's I can hear it. I can't see your heart. God searches the heart. But I can hear your heart. How do I hear it? Because out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. And since our citizenship is in, in heaven, heaven, isn't it? It's our conversation. That's the way the King James translates citizenship there, right. because that's what it that's what it is. Yeah. So yeah, you know, you you need to talk differently than you talked before you were saved. That's a fact. And that's how you know where people are from is by, by the conversation. your conversations. Okay. Conversation. So if, if he goes on, he says, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The simple answer to that natural tendency, for those of us who are seated in heavenly places, has already been written for our instruction. Remember? Whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. So in Psalm 73, 25, and I think you actually said this at the end of last week. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. It's surely about what you desire. Your conversation is going to be driven by what you desire. Because in the in chapter in verse three, it talks about the lust of our flesh indulging the desires. Right, exactly. Of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's the desires of the corrupt flesh and the unrenewed mind, or the desires of a heart cleansed and renewed by the blood of the Lamb. Mm-hmm. New creation. Well, a new creation has a new heart. Yes. And that new heart should bring forth something new. Yes. So we're supposed to fix our heart, our eyes, and our minds on Jesus, the lover of my soul, mm-hmm. as Charles Wesley wrote in that beautiful hymn back in like 1740, right? Mm-hmm. Doing that will make him the desire of your heart. And you will know the wonderful truth of these verses. His mouth is full of sweetness, and he is wholly desirable. I am my beloved, and his desire is for me. The Song of Solomon, that's chapter 5, I read verses 16, and then chapter 7, verse 10. Mm. Where's your desire? I mean, think of that verse. I desire nothing on earth but thee. Well, and our only desire is to please him. Our dear brother, Arthur Burke, now going to be with the Lord, used to say, what a man believes in his heart rules him. But that's true. Yes. But what, what you believe in your heart is going to, what, going to determine what you desire. Yes. And your desires will drive you, right? Yes. All right, I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. His great love with which he loved us. I love that. You know, I've said so many times in the past, Christianity is not about stained glass windows, padded pews, pipe organs, big cathedrals. It's about a love affair with Jesus Christ. It's not about animal sacrifices, rituals, and relics. It's all about his great love with which he loved us. And always remember this. We love him because he first loved us, as it says in 1 John 4.19. Right? It's, it's funny because I, I said that to Alice the other day. I asked her, I, I, just, I was praying, and I said, Alice, why do you love me? And she had some good answers. But I said, there's one reason you love me, because I first loved you. And that's true. And that is true. You know, loved me before I loved him. Well, it's, it's true. It's uh, God's given me that opportunity to see this in action in my life. It's um, I flew as an air crewman in the U.S. Navy, and I, I I'd come back to drop off a plane and get another plane in New York uh, one weekend because I, I used to get those hops because I lived in New York and that was a blessing to me. And I'd come home for I don't even know it was for a whole weekend. It's a short stint. Yeah, but somebody invited me to a party for a friend of ours who was going into the going into the military, 
And I didn't really want to go, but I got talked into it. And when I went, I went to that party, and there at that party, for the first time in my life, I saw Alice. I went home that night, and I said to my mother, now I was like 21, 20 years around that, right? I must have been 21. Yeah. And I said to my mother, I just met the girl I'm going to marry. I fell in love. It truly was love at first sight. It wasn't so for Alice. It took me a little bit longer. Because she loved me because I first loved her. I wore it down. <laughs> okay. We were meant to be. Well, it was, because that was the hand of God. Yes, it was. And the love of God, the great love of God, would work in our lives. Yes. I mean, it drew me, it drew me to Jesus. It, 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 God brought me to you, it drew you to me. Oh, I read. Thank you, Jesus. So it says in verse 6 and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Seated us in heavenly places. Now, this might not appear to be a reality in our lives right now before his return. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I appear to be seated right here right now. Mm -hmm. But the word of God is true. Yes, it is. All right. So how will it appear, that reality come to appear? It won't unless we come to know and obey the word of scriptures. Mm -hmm. It says in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witness surrounding us, mm -hmm. let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangled us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's how he got to the seat of the heavenly places, right? So we need to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. He's in heavenly places. You know, uh, one of my favorite old hymns, and this uh, goes back many, many years, it was from uh, Helen Lamell. And I think she must have been seated in heavenly places now when, when I first found this. She wrote the words of this beautiful hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You know how you can find out you're seated in heaven? Fix your eyes on Jesus. And everything else will start to disappear around you. Set your mind on the things above. Not on the things that are on earth. That's what Paul wrote to the Colossians, Colossians 3 2. So when you set your mind on the things above, when you set your eyes on Jesus who is above, all of a sudden you'll start to be more and more conscious of your of, of what Christ has done in your life, what God the Father has done through Christ. And yes, you are seated in heavenly places with him even now. We don't I said before we don't understand death. We don't understand time. We do not understand time. So the Lord of days is a thousand years, a thousand years of a day. We have a very, very poor recognition of what time is in, in eternity. And eternity is the absence of time. So when you do that, when you fix your eyes on Jesus and you fix your mind on, on the things above, that's going to result in this. And I'm going to read Revelation 3.21. He who overcomes... I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. How is that going to happen? Because mm. when you overcome, right? We are overcomers. We are overcomers. We're more than conquerors, yes, right? All right, so going on to verses 7, 8, and 9, it says, So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Not of works. It's the free gift of God, right? But it's because of the surpassing, the King James says, exceeding riches of his grace. Now, you know, the Lord would say to Paul, my grace is sufficient. To address him when he was in his in his weakness, right? In Second Corinthians twelve. Go look it up. 
But Paul, who is the chief of sinners, as it says in First Timothy in the first chapter, truly realized that God's grace far surpassed and exceeded the need. It was and still is both abundant and amazing. Hallelujah. That's right. Amazing. It's not about works. Amen. It is. You know, you sing the song, you really get a clue in what it's about, that amazing grace. Because God did for you through his son Jesus Christ what you could never in a million years do for yourself. He saved you a wretch like me. Because you couldn't go to church enough, you couldn't fast enough, you couldn't tithe enough, you couldn't you can't do anything on your, of your own on your own that's gonna make you right with God the Father. That's it. it took the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that shed blood represents the incredible grace of God who gave Jesus in our place. Okay, for grace, you by grace, you have been saved through faith. Now, as, as you can see here, I'm not going to be able to get into this too much because this is so important. You can see here, Paul obviously knew that wonderful truth. And then Martin Luther would come to realize that truth in the 1500s. But somewhere along the line, error and heresy reared its ugly head in the church. People again came in the church, came to believe that they are indeed saved as a result of works. Mm, not true. Not true. It's a lie. So, yeah, we're going to get into this more next week, but think about it. The great example of that is the Church of Galatians. Yes. Well, Paul writes them and says, Who has bewitched you? Oh, you foolish generation. You know, what you started in the spirit, you're going to end trying to perfect in the flesh. You, you can't do that. You have to come to know the grace of God because I promise you, you know, I, I, I distract myself, mm -hmm. but it's not a distraction. Something has happened to me in the last couple of years, and I've always tried to make habits out of things that I know are, are the right thing to do. And people will continually say to me, you know, we travel so much, and people say, oh, God bless you. And I say, he does. Mm -hmm. And he blesses me far, far more than I deserve. Because you know what? There's only one thing I deserve. Death. Because we are sinners. Yes. And the wages of sin is death. It was only because God took what we deserve and placed it on Jesus Christ so that we get what Jesus deserved, that perfect right relationship with the Father. Oh, yeah. And if that's not cause for Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. I don't know what is. Thank you, Jesus. So we're gonna. I want to talk more about that next week because, it, as I say, it really is so important. But kind of spend some time thinking about it, meditating on it. You know, you sing the song "Amazing Grace" and don't give it a thought. It's just a nice tune. But the fact of the matter is, it is it far surpasses, it exceeds all that we deserve or need, and we should be giving thanks every single day for it. So, Father, we do. We come before you and we give you thanks for your glorious graciousness. Lord, that you took us, miserable sinners, Lord, deserving nothing but death, and gave us the gift of life by putting our sin on your Son, Jesus Christ, nailing him to a cross so that he would die in our place. How can we say thanks? All the things that he has done for us. So say thanks to the Lord a lot this week. We bless you and we praise you. Thank you, Father. And we pray that you have a blessed week. Be used this week by God for his glory. Mm -hmm. In his name. Amen and amen. Till next time, God bless you. Mighty love